Hi, I'm Mateusz Resterny and I love learning. I went to drum lessons. I tried to play ukulele. I'm getting better at Dark Souls and Elden Ring. I manage a custom network and a home server. And by the way, it's on Arch Linux. Uh, I even wrote the, uh, this, uh, the slides for this talk in Markdown in Obsidian and exported it to HTML. Um, if there is something new and exciting, I'm willing to try it. Oh, and also, I like programming. Like, a lot. I started with functional programming in F Sharp, as one usually does, but then transitioned to something a bit more exciting. Game development at Pixeland. I got to see a lot of code from the biggest and most widely used engines and frameworks. And it was fine. I mean, really, it is fine. Um, we're making games and having fun with it. Um, but still, I was looking back to that clean, pure, functional style. And I think I've found it. Okay, how many of you have ever tried writing something in Rust? Oh my God, that's a lot of you, cool, great. And how many of you uh, are uh, game, game developers in some other language? Great, great. I will be making some comparisons to C++, but they should pretty much apply to any other language. And for those of you who aren't game devs, uh, I think Rust is a pretty good starting point, maybe. <laughs> um, oh yeah, and for those of you who do program games, how many of you actually like writing your code? Nice, I like it as well. Um, I program in C++ daily, however, even with all of the features that uh, C++ is uh, importing, I think there are just some things that C++ can't borrow from Rust. Cool. Let's start with what, what makes them similar. So, unlike Java or C Sharp, Rust compiles to native code. It doesn't run in a VM and has, has no uh, garbage collector. All memory management is manual and fully controlled by the programmer. On the other hand, however, Rust feels much more like a high-level language. Functions are the main building blocks of your program. The type system is rich and well-designed. And Rust claims to be fully type-safe and also memory-safe. This means that all references must always be valid. No null pointers, no hanging references. So I obviously decided to test Rust claims on a real-life example, something more than just a hello world and something more game dev oriented. So I decided I should write a game's physics engine. How hard can that be? And by the magic of coding two of them, I have a one-to-one -one comparison between Rust and C++. By the way, through this talk, the physics engine will act more like an example. I don't expect you to have any physical knowledge, uh, nor should you expect to learn exactly <laughs> how to write a physics engine. However, I think a basic overview will be helpful. So, when you think about physics engine, you probably picture the most obvious stuff, like the movement simulation. The engine is responsible for gathering all the forces, it calculates the velocities, and then tries to estimate the positions of bodies. We call it position integration. There is also the collision detection. It's usually split into two parts. The broad phase, which is fast but coarse. Its main job is to quickly discard those objects that definitely don't collide. And then there is the narrow phase, which precisely calculates the exact collision, but can be a lot slower. Finally, there is the constraint resolution. Constraints specify how bodies move. So collisions are constraints as well as ropes or joints between bones. They all limit and dictate how a body moves. For my example, I chose a rather simple, but also very fitting to games solution, which is position-based dynamics. The algorithm is to uh, fix broken constraints one by one in a loop. The theory is that this uh, solution eventually converges on the correct solution. 
Um, yeah, so let's look at a simple C++ implementation of the loop. The code should be pretty much self-explanatory. We are integrating positions of bodies, detecting collisions between them, and resolving constraints. I am obviously skipping uh, rendering steps or player input, just focusing on the physics side. In Rust, the code didn't change that much. The syntax is basically the same. But here is where we have to make our first decision, that is, how to pass arguments into functions. In C++, the simplest way is to do it by value. But that just introduces an implicit copy. The next uh, invocation will not see the updated positions. This is clearly not what we want. We can send it by a pointer. This allows us to update bodies in place, but we run the risk of the pointer being null. And we don't want to clutter the code with unnecessary um, checks. So, obviously, a reference. The simplest and also the safest solution as references cannot be null in C++. The compiler will check for it. Cool. Now, Rust. In Rust, uh, parameters are consumed by the function by default. The function is free to do anything with the consumed parameter. However, its value cannot be used after the call. It's gone now. We want to somehow share the collection of bodies between functions. So we have to borrow them. Borrowing in Rust is very similar to a reference in C++. They even share the same syntax. Um, however, Rust makes it clear on the caller's side as well that the borrow occurred. There is one more thing. In Rust, everything is constant by default. So we have to explicitly state that we want to mutate the bodies. And also, this mute specifier has to be visible also on the caller's side. Um, so just by glancing at the code, we can already tell that integrate positions will mutate the bodies, but detect collisions will not. And as you will hopefully see, Rust is explicit where it matters, but not verbose. Everything that it deems unsafe has to be visible. This includes borrows and mutations. Clones um, are also explicit, as they may involve expensive copying. You just saw that parameters are consumed by the function by default. There are no implicit copies, nor move semantics like in C++. Error handling is also done explicitly through the return value of a function. In Rust, exceptions are usually considered to be bugs. Um, which is also fitting to games, as we don't often throw exceptions. Now, <clears throat> for the um, simplest uh, collision detection, we can just brute force it. Uh, so we first get all pairs of bodies. Um, so if there are more collisions at once, we just split them and deal with pairs. We f find those pairs that collide, and if they do, we resolve each collision. Again, starting with simple C++ code. In a loop, where we're dealing with iterators, uh, sorry, with indexes on all bodies. In the nested loop, we should start from the next index, as we don't want to deal with duplicates or the object colliding with itself. Inside, we check for collision between bodies, and inside all of that, we finally run the resolution code if there is one, uh, if there is a collision. This code, however, feels a little bit like the uh, row pointer, pointer example. We can make a mistake with index arithmetics. Um, I think we can do better. Well, C++ has iterators. They nicely abstract away the row index and are usually the preferred option. However, You'll notice that the structure of the code didn't really change that much. That's because C++ reflects almost one-to-one -one how the CPU runs instructions. You have to think like a machine when writing your code. In Rust, the situation is a bit different. Bodies is the container that we want to iterate on. So first, let's create an iterator. 
Notice that we don't have to deal with beginning or end ending. The iterator itself has all the required information. We then turn it into an iterator on all pairs. Um, this is called an iterator adapter. It takes one iterator and transforms it into another one. Next, we use another adapter, a filter. It, this one takes a function as a parameter. Body collides, checks for collision between bodies. The result is yet another iterator that visits only the colliding pairs. Finally, for each collision, we run some resolution code. Notice that the iterators we've used are uh, immutable, so we have to borrow bodies again mutably to actually update the collection. Let's read the code again. Bodies, iter, into pairs, filter body collides for each collision, resolve collision with mutable bodies. Rust code reads almost like English. It's just much more natural to think in a general way and abstract uh, implementation away. Um, we've just built a layer upon a layer of computation in the direction of data flow. <coughs> However, the code doesn't compile. Let's read the error code. Closure requires unique access to bodies, but it is already borrowed. It's the borrow checker. And it's enforcing its rules. That is, each variable can be borrowed multiple times, but immutably, or mutably, but only one time. And this is exactly what, what we are doing wrong. The iterators are borrowing the bodies collection immutably, so it's fine. But then we want to uh, borrow again mutably. The compiler won't compile this code. Well, we could introduce an intermediate value. Let's get all of the collisions and resolve them at once. This still doesn't work because iterators in Rust are lazy. They iterate only on as many items as needed. What's more, they will do nothing unless requested. Um, so we just declared the intent of iteration but did not perform any action. The iterator will do nothing and just hold the borrow. So we have to consume uh, the iterator and collect the results into a vector. This frees the original borrow, so it is safe to borrow again mutably. The borrow checker operates on lifetimes. Um, the compiler will make sure that the borrows are always valid, so it will extend its lifetime until the very last use. You also saw that the borrow is preserved through multiple iterators. So the lifetime can span multiple function calls. If we didn't collect um, the results, the iterators will be needed until the very last coll uh, collision is resolved. So the lifetimes will overlap. This is what the borrow checker will not allow. Cool. Now, the engine will be especially boring if it only dealt with a single body type. In games, we have a wide variety of objects. We have characters running, we have cars driving and buildings collapsing, and it all has to interact with each other um, in an engine. So to model this in C++, we could use inheritance, nice object-oriented design. We first declare an interface of body that provides some collision detection. Then, a sphere, a cube, and a car, all inheriting from the common base class. Uh, with this approach, we can even store all of our bodies in a single container. However, um, inheritance in C++ in introduces uh, virtual call tables. And storing variables on a heap this way causes memory fragmentation, both of which aren't particularly uh, performance friendly. So we could use a union. Now our body has a kind and storage for all of its variants. Well, even though it's, it doesn't suffer from performance issues, it's much more error prone. Here I specified that the body kind is a cube and straight away set its, its radius. 
Oops. The key takeaway from that is that the C++ compiler trusts you. You have to know what you are doing because um, the compiler won't get in the way, but it won't offer much help either. If you don't know what you're doing or just forgotten how to, the compiler often won't stop you from making mistakes. Now let's see Rust. Um, it deals with this problem with algorithmic um, type system. So the enum in Rust is supercharged. It represents the logical OR of whole types. So the body can either be a sphere or a cube or a car. Notice that this information is not stored in a value, but rather in the type. So the compiler will check it. To deal with um, enums in Rust, we use a match statement, which is very similar to a C++ switch statement, but again, it's supercharged. It allows to deconstruct the inner structure of the enum. Here, uh, we're accessing the radius of the sphere. But if we try to access the radius of a cube, we get an error. It also checks for missing cases. Here we forgot uh, to check for a car. What's more, it even allows to match against much more complex patterns. For example, in the narrow phase collision detection, we can match against every single possible pair of bodies and run a specific code for them. So for example, a sphere and a cube colliding, or a cube and a car colliding. And the compiler will run all of, this, uh, of its checks. Speaking of collisions, um, defining one is a surprisingly hard problem. We could try to calculate the exact volume of overlap between the two bodies, but that can get really complex really quickly. And it's not strictly needed. A simpler solution would be to just compute the deepest penetration. Uh, in physics engines, we usually split that into a collision normal vector and a depth. That's because the, to calculate the collision is to actually check for it. Uh, it's the last part, the step of the collision detection. So if the depth is negative, we know there wasn't a collision in the first place. Cool. In C++, the code looks something like this. We calculate the collision between A and B. We check for depth if it's positive. And if it is, we calculate the displacement vector and move bodies in the opposite direction. This way, we know that after running this code, the bodies will no longer collide. However, this code um, is a bit smelly, I think. What if we don't check for, for the depth? Is the normal even meaningful if there isn't a collision? In Rust, we don't have that problem. The normal and depth exist only in the inner structure of the enum, of one of the enum variants. If there isn't a collision, we get back a completely different type. There is no room to, for a mistake. And this pattern of encoding state in types is super common in Rust. You just saw it used uh, for functions that may or may not return a value. They return an option that either has some value or none. It is also the backbone of error handling. A function that can fail either returns a success with a value or re reports an error. The takeaway from that is that you can trust Rust compiler much more. You can be sure that borrows are always valid. Mutations are always exclusive. The compiler promises to optimize iterators away so they are zero-cost abstractions. The types are statically checked, obviously, but if you encode your state in types, the compiler will check it for you. Rust does a lot of the boring, boring bookkeeping for you, so you can rest assured that your code is correct. Cool. Um, now, to let that sink in for a little bit, I prepared a small uh, demo. Nice. 
uh, it's it's really dark. Um, uh, it's just a, a demo made with Bevy, which is a Rust-based engine. The player can control a red, a red sphere and can create other objects. Um, the sphere can move and interact with the world. So the player can move the objects around, but also be moved by them. You may be able to notice that in the uh, top corner, there is an algorithm used. Uh, right now it's running the uh, brute force approach that we saw code for, but I can switch it to a hash grid. A hash grid is uh, similar to a uh, hash map, but in three dimensional. This runs much faster and allows for a lot more objects to be handled at once. Finally, there is the sweep and prune alg alg algorithm, which is even faster. We'll talk about it in a moment. Um, and the whole engine was compiled to a static library. And the cool part is that it provides the same interface as a C++ implementation of the same algorithms. So I can switch in runtime. Right now, it's running C++ code. Again, the brute force algorithm. There will be a hash grid as well. Here it is. And next, the sweep and prune. Um, you may be able to tell that at some point uh, I run out of time uh, and C++ implementation is a little bit buggy. Uh, it doesn't actually remove the objects, but don't worry about it. Cool. Now, let's get a bit deeper into the most juicy slices. I may not be explaining here in full detail. I just want you to get the taste for what Rust brings to the table. Again, let's start with a bit of theory. So the separating axis theorem states that if you can stick a piece of paper between two objects, well, they don't collide, obviously. Um, how a computer actually computes that is by casting a shadow. If the first shadow ends before the other one begins, the objects don't collide. What we can do now is to pick a couple of axes, say the primary axis, cast a shadow of all of the objects on, in our uh, scene, and sort them. And now we have a nice brute force, uh, sorry, broad face algorithm called sweep and prune. If the shadows don't overlap, well, the objects definitely don't collide. Here is a simple implementation in, in Rust. So for each axis, we cast a shadow and we get the minimum and maximum value, the starting and stopping points of the shadow. We can store them in, a, in an array and then sort the array. Cool, pretty simple stuff. Um, now, casting a shadow, say, of a sphere is a rather trivial task. A bit more involved example uh, is casting a shadow of a cube. So, for each vertex of a cube, we can project it on an axis and then get the minimum and maximum value of all of them. This will get us the, the starting and stopping points of the shadow. Nice. Um, but the min and ma min max function is not defined in the standard library. And it would be really convenient to have it um, as it is used in multiple places in multiple algorithms. Fortunately, in Rust, we can extend existing types using uh, extension traits. A trait is like an interface defined for an iterator that, in, uh, that iterates on items that are, can be ordered and copied. It provides a method that consumes the original iterator and outputs two items. It is wrapped in an option type because the iterator can be empty. We don't know that. Uh, in that case, we output none. Inside, we use the standard min and max function to, to get the minimum and maximum value, albeit in a bit of a functional matter. And here is the amazing part. Here's the, where the magic happens. We tell the compiler to implement our trait for all iterators, no matter where they come from. There can be our own iterators. 
they can be uh, third party iterators. They can come from the standard library. Even better, one library can, implement, can provide the trait, the other can provide the type, and they can all work seamlessly together without even knowing of each other's existence. No need for upstream changes or for uh, ugly hooks. Cool. Now, another optimization that we can uh, try to make is the following observation. Um, between frames, the objects usually don't move by a lot. So it would be really wasteful to recalculate everything from scratch. What we can do instead is to store the sorted array of shadows and just update it whenever it's needed. This provides a significant, significant um, speed up. But we may run into a big, big problem. Um, the borrow checker ensures that uh, access to bodies is exclusive. Right now, it's split evenly into position integration, collision detection, and constraint resolution. And it's spread across multiple frames. What we want, however, is to store some results for a long time. Clearly, we, we can't use a borrow for this. The lifetime will, will overlap and the borrow checker will stop us from doing that. So we have to introduce a proxy system. Now, when we insert a body, when we create a new body, what we get back is a proxy. It's like an index or a key to the value stored. Um, the proxy doesn't hold the borrow, so it is safe to store the proxy for a long time. You may think that this proxy system is, works against the borrow checker. In my opinion, however, it works with it, because to actually access the collection, to actually access the stored value, we have to borrow the entire collection again. What we are essentially doing is limiting how long we have to borrow it for. To implement this proxy system, I borrowed a nice idea uh, of an arena from Catherine West, who did a great talk about ECS in Rust. The arena is composed of entries. It's a vector of entries. Each entry can either be taken and contain a value, or it can be free and form a linked list of items to be reused. Now, the proxy has to hold a generation counter. That's because uh, each time an entry is reused, we increment the counter. If the counts don't match, we have detected this, a stale proxy. Its original value was removed and replaced with a new one. Nice. In my opinion, in Rust, um, it's much more convenient to compose more complex algorithms from smaller pieces. Um, in C++, it's, it's made much more difficult. You either have to deal with um, runtime polymorphism and cost of that, or you have to deal with templates, which on the bigger scale is just hell to deal with. Um, you just saw min-max function that is defined for iterators. Arena is completely generic. Um, they don't even know ab about each other, yet they can come together and form a nice algorithm. Now, you may be thinking, what's the price of all of that? What's the price of the, all, all of the checks and the, um, and the, the answers that the, comp the, that the compiler is giving us? Well, I needed to test that. So I uh, created a bunch of synthetic benchmarks. They run Rust and C++ for each of the uh, broad phase algorithms. I also validated that they uh, output the same result. And here is the result. At least for the brute force, C++, sorry, Rust is a bit faster than C++. Um, what I found out is that the Rust compiler was able to vectorize uh, the operation. Even though it was done with iterators and no raw loops, 
it was still faster in Rust than in C++. Now, um, the picture is uh, not that great uh, for the hash grid. C++ is a bit faster. Um, however, Rust is slower by a, a little bit, not by a whole um, order of magnitude, as you would expect from a high-level language. The sweep and prune algorithm is just fascinating to me because Rust and C++ are so similar to, to each other. They are two different languages and they ex uh, exhibit the same behavior, the exponen exponential growth with the input size increase. But still, C++ was a little bit faster. Now, let's go to the summary. I, had, I purposefully skipped a bit of stuff for Rust. Um, for example, multi-threading. The borrow checker, if you think about it, ensures exclusive access to, uh, to the value. That sounds a lot like a mutex. So you get multi-threading for free in Rust. Maybe uh, an idea for another talk. <laughs> now, Rust comes preloaded with an, an entire ecosystem in the form of cargo toolchain. It has dependency management. It has encode documentation. It has run a unit test. It has formatting and linting, all built in and ready to be used from the very beginning of your project. Also, Rust is gaining popularity fast. Firefox was probably the first big one and the most widely used uh, project that uses Rust. Rust is also the only language besides C and uh, Assembler to be accepted into the Linux kernel. So now Rust runs the clouds, at least in a smart, small part. Um, what's more, JetBrains recently announced a Rust exclusive IDE, the Rust Rover. But are we game yet? .rs is a website that tracks statistics. So it turns out that we are in a very peculiar spot. There are over 40 Rust-based engines and like 12 games released. <laughs> okay, um, in my opinion, it's just a niche to be filled. Maybe we should just start using Rust. Mm. If writing your next AAA game is out of question, you can use uh, the C and Rust integration. For example, Godot has now native bindings and Rust can integrate with that. Or you could try writing a smaller helper, to helper tools. I saw a lot of Rust tools in my everyday use uh, on the command line. Or you could try Rust in the next game jam. It can really work. And here's the proof. Um, we made an internal game jam at Pixeland and I managed to win it using Rust. So uh, the best part is that the program didn't even crash once during the entire development process. Uh, rapid integration and prototyping is made much simpler when you don't have to deal with runtime errors. And Rust's strict compiler can help eliminate those. In the end, everything that I've shown you isn't that revolutionary. Uh, most ideas were borrowed from uh, other solutions and you can safely implement them all in another languages. What other languages and C++ specifically can't borrow from Rust, however, is the compiler that actually encourages these good practices. Thank you. The talk is open source. Here's the source for you for it if you want. And do you have any questions? Yes. Um, so you mentioned this fancy uh, Rust menu. Um, yeah. And if I understood correctly, these types are um, tracked by compiler, right? Yeah. Yes. How does it work here? Yeah. Uh, for completely dynamic uh, types, 
the enum won't work. It has to be compiled, like, like you said. Uh, Rust has a way of dynamic uh, typing. It's also very explicit. Everything that deals with dynamic types has a dyn keyword in Rust. Uh, and that obviously introduces the same drawbacks from, as C++. However, the dynamic dispatch in Rust works a little bit differently. Um, in C++, the, uh, when you get a pointer to a dynamic type, you have to dereference de a pointer, and then you have to dereference the virtual call table and get to the to the method, the virtual method. In Rust, uh, it uses fat pointers, so basically you get a pointer to the data and a pointer to the um, to the implementation, and uh, that's implementation detail, everything. But yeah, uh, it can do dynamic typing as well, and it uses tra uh, traits for that. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, I really tried hard to use std variant for this one, and it was absolutely unusable. Like, to, to match against different variants in the std variant is like 50 lines of code. Maybe I'm uh, exaggerating. The thing that is making most of the match because it's hard Yes, yes, yes. Yes, exactly. Um, the, the enum in, in Rust has a hidden variable that holds the uh, enum kind, uh, the enum kind, but it's all hidden away and it's proven by the compiler to be always correct. Uh, in C++, it's templates and hell. Any other questions? Cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I have a question about the benchmarks because uh, I assume you showed us the benchmark of the release builds with all the optimizations. Yes. But do you have any benchmarks for, for example, like the debug builds uh, or, for example, the benchmark of how fast does the, the project compile or stuff like that? Because it's, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so starting with the compilation issue because I, I, I know this, this is the hot topic kind of. Uh, Rust was at, at first famous for long compilation time. Uh, and in small projects, it is much more visible because in Rust, for example, you're, you're doing this a lot, a lot of this, this kind of type of code that is very much generic. You're dealing with iterators and uh, behind the scenes, the compiler is generating a lot of code. Uh, this is exactly like C++ templates, uh, but it doesn't uh, produce the unreadable error codes of C++ uh, templates. So yes, the compilation time can be a lot longer because uh, Rust is doing, Rust compiler is doing a lot more. Uh, sorry, I've, uh, I got lost. Uh, what was the, your question? Yeah, the other part was about the debug builds. How, yes. how does it compare? Um, I don't know. Uh, I haven't uh, uh, run the benchmarks on the, the debug builds. Uh, I use the release the standard release uh, mode for C++ and, um, and Rust. I know that Bevy is pretty much unusable in uh, debug mode. Um, yeah, it can be a lot slower. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got a question related to C++. Have you heard that uh, about the proposal of adding pattern matching to C++ 23 and how it compares to what, what Rust has? I haven't seen the new proposal for C++, um, but I'm guessing it's all about templates. No? Uh, I don't know. Well, uh, I don't know the details, but rather not. It's like a like new syntax for basically similar to this. I don't remember exactly, but mm -hmm. it, it might be inspired by trust, basically. Yeah, um, so C++ famously borrows everything from other languages, but still, um, it's the compiler inside. Uh, like, uh, I am really skeptical that C++ will provide you with a coherent error message when you mess up your match statement. Um, 
An amazing part of Rust is that the compiler actually teaches you how to write Rust. So when you make a common mistake, it actually provides you with a little snippet how to fix that. Uh, the documentation is amazing in Rust. Everything is in code. Uh, I just don't see that happening in C++. In C++, it will be just another way of doing things, right? Like N plus one way of doing things. And in Rust, I guess it's like a default. Yes, yes, yes. It's very much like Rust has this uh, idea of idiomatic code. I haven't heard about idiomatic C++ code. Everyone writes whatever, and it works usually. Uh, in Rust, people tend to converge on a single solution. Um, the, the language is, is just uh, a little bit uh, more designed. Uh, I just have a question about the compile times because C++ is known from the slow compile times usually if you use templates. Mm -hmm. And have you compared how the Rust, because it looks like with all these checks, uh, the Rust still could go pretty slow on compilation. So do you have any data related to that? Um, Rust underneath uses LLVM. So uh, I compared the uh, I don't have concrete data for that. Um, the compilation for Rust feels slower because uh, you're dealing with uh, generic stuff a lot more. Uh, but I don't know if you wrote the, exactly the same code in C++ and Rust. I'm guessing Rust will be a bit slower, yeah. Okay, are you going to really, I mean, particularly you or your company, to use Rust in future projects? I'm really hoping, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I, I don't know, there is a lot of pushback for Rust and that's why I'm here. I just don't see the appeal of C++ now. I am a new developer and I just don't want to learn every single thing about C++, like the dynamic cast can sometimes uh, throw an error if you, you're using references. Well, it, it does make sense because a reference cannot be null in C++, but you have to remember that all. In Rust, it's just designed, uh, the compiler is designed to catch uh, errors and to guide you through the, uh, to, through the code. And um, I just much more prefer to think about algorithms and not implementation. The optimizers are getting better and better. The code, the uh, assembly will get uh, more and more difficult to uh, comprehend. The processors are doing more and more work uh, off screen that we have no control over. So why not uh, just give away even more control for a much better experience uh, developing? And I would really hope that it catches uh, wind. Yeah, but I have no concrete, concrete plans. Cool, if you want to uh, catch me, I will be outside. Uh, I love talking about Rust, so you can catch me and ask questions later. Thank you very much again.